Welcome back, Seaweed Brain listeners. We have a very special guest. Like I said, we weren't joking. We weren't lying. Marco Shiro is in the house <laughs> tonight. <laughs> Stick around. <laughs> Did you think that was a lie? <laughs> I don't, the episode hasn't come out yet, but I feel like when I brought it up in the last one, I was being kind of like, like it could have been misinterpreted as being sarcastic in some way. Um, this has been planned for a while. Oh, yeah, it has been. Oh my gosh, Mark, <laughs> welcome. What? Oh, hi, sorry. Anyway, hello, welcome to all of you. <laughs> I, it me that I'm pretty sure we started planning this before the book came out. Oh, yeah. This yeah. has been, Long yeah, time. we talked about this like what? I think it was January. January. I found a note in my notes app from January of this year that was yeah. like, these are like three things Mark said and like, oh, and, and like reach back out at some point and like blah, 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 from long before <laughs> the book was even out. Yeah. Um, something we do to authors when they come on our podcast is um, torture and praise them by reading their bio. So we're going to do that right now, just in case <laughs> anyone is under a rock um, and doesn't know who Mark Oshiro is. All right. Straight from the internet. Mark Oshiro, they them, is the award-winning author of the young adult books Anger is a Gift, Each of Us a, Each of Us a Desert, and Into the Light, as well as their middle grade books, The Insiders, You Only Live Once, David Bravo, and Star Wars Hunters Battle for the Arena. They are also the co-author with Rick Riordan of the number one New York Times bestseller and number one indie bestseller, The Sun and the Star, Colon, a Nico D'Angelo adventure. When not writing, they are trying to pet every dog in the world. Welcome, Mark. Applause, everyone. Applause, snaps. Thank you for having me on this prestigious podcast. And now the podcast <laughs> is about to begin. So excited. Um, I believe, so I was looking at that notes app note I wrote back in January, and I, I wrote down Mark Colon, quote, you think we aren't going balls to the wall because, like, it's a single book or a first right. story here, but it's balls to the wall. And I just have to say that was true. <laughs> It was. And I, I, I think where that came from too is I was seeing a lot of things online, not a whole bunch. Like I, I got to a point in like late 2022 where I was like, I'm going to have to start muting people because I just don't want to hear theories. I don't want any of this to like be, I just want it to be like this beautiful thing. And I was like, this is getting to be a lot because I think I also vastly under it, under or underestimated how many of you there are. Like totally, there <laughs> More Percy Jackson fans than I thought, but I, I saw a lot of sort of trepidation about like sort of this idea that Rick and I would both hold each other's back in the sense of like we both wouldn't go all the way, and like because we we're bringing, you know Rick was bringing in a new person that we were both sort of temper each other. Where I think the exact opposite happened, which is we both unlocked each other and became more unhinged. Yeah, the- I have to agree. I hope was also represented in the live show. Like it is been such a beautiful thing to find out this person you adore from a distance is not only amazing in person, but like our vibes from the beginning have been so immaculate that multiple people are like, <laughs> I keep waiting for the vibes to not be immaculate. And it's not hap- like, it is just, we got along immediately <laughs> with very similar styles. So I was like, I get why people, I fully understand why anyone in the fandom was like, I don't know. I don't know what this is going to be like. But I was like, let me assure you, we are out of control. And we are going to be out of control <laughs> because why would we be out of control for a Nico book? Uh, um, We are going to talk a little bit about the tour because Carter and I both had such a great time. And we've been like referencing <laughs> back to it frequently. We actually, as of right now, we finished recording all episodes for the book as of yesterday. Um, so we are like ready to talk. And we've been referencing back to the book tour and like events of the book tour, specifically the role of Stephanie on the book tour. We yeah. really, we want to talk about that. Um, Please, I would love to before, talk about uh, before we get into the, like the, the book, the book and like the collab, the collab, um, you have mentioned before, like um, going from like your corner of publishing into this, like yeah. this machine of Disney, that was like a transition. Do you want to speak a little bit more about that? Like yeah. the process of creating this? The joke I've been making, which is a joke based very much in reality, is I was in this tiny queer corner of publishing, which is not to sort of denigrate my own journey. Like I'm really, really proud of my books and really proud 
of how they're still mm-hmm. selling after five years. You know, Anger's a Gift in the, is in its like 11th or 12th printing and it's sold over 100,000 copies. Like, so it is, I have achieved a lot with my teams, both at Macmillan and at Harper. Um, but it is also reality that that is like a pea, a pea size, like in a pea mm-hmm. pod that is very tiny compared to the, you sort of Disney, Rick Rarden, Percy Jackson thing. Um, and I was very, I'm going to be very, I was so in denial about how big this was and not just the fandom, but just <laughs> that experience with in publishing. Um, uh, at the same time, the great part about it is that my interactions was just me, Stephanie Lurie, the editor, Rick and, and, uh, and Becky, like it, and that made that, that smallness, that intimacy, I think, you know, squashed a lot of my own fears and my own, you know, sort of like anxieties about writing this book. Um, but yeah, it is it is strange to go from a place where I have had to kind of fight for my space in publishing, you know, not be, because of my team, but just being queer, being Latinx, being non-binary, you know, um, not always having all the same opportunities as other authors. I mean, there were so many author, like lifetime author goals that I didn't mm-hmm. get until this book, which was my seventh book. Like, so it was seven books down the line that a lot of these goals came true. Um, and I, I credit a lot of that to the immensely hard work that Rick and his team did on this book. But it is very, it, I don't know that I've processed it yet. It's been three and a half months. <laughs> three and a half months on the bestseller list. <laughs> yeah, I did. I, like, I get the emails every Wednesday and I'm like, right. I don't, I th- I wanted it once in my career for one week, once, and I would be happy. Like that first week, I did, I did cry. It was like really emotional over it. And then it happened again. And I was like, yeah. oh, okay. I think the second week we got number two, or maybe it was the third week. Like, And then I was like, okay, cool. This is amazing. This is never going to... And then it just kept happening. And, and now I'm at, a po- I'm at a point where I'm like, who who are you? Who is <laughs> my... Who are you? Um it's wild. Um, yeah. So yeah, it has been very surreal to experience this. Oh my gosh, I'm oh, so many questions. But first, um, <laughs> we saw your beautifully annotated books. I think you posted a picture at some point in the writing process with the the tabs, the color coded note <laughs> pieces. Mark is turning around and searching um, their library. Everybody, uh, audio <laughs> medium. <laughs> Beautiful. Olympus. I'm holding yes. up Blood of Olympus. Incredible. Can this be where I reveal the code? Please. I, oh, that's wow. perfect. But it was. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, and part of that was because I, I knew, look, I'm not fandom naive. I knew <laughs> if I said, hey, this is what this color means, all of you would find out exactly what page it was on. Um, yeah. I did have a code for the different colors. Let me, I'm pulling up my notes document. Okay, post-it note meanings. <laughs> it's a key. I did. I don't have a key. Blue is anything for Nico's memories or or actually like spoken out defined emotions. So okay. blue was like, you know, sad Nico. Like I needed yeah. all of the canon stuff for that. Green is, is canon historical stuff relating to Nico, his past, his family, or his powers. Um, so that's like the nitty gritty of canon. Pink is for, <laughs> God, I forgot I wrote this. Pink is for anything that can be used for maximum damage. <laughs> yeah. Max HP. Let me look what this one is. Oh my God, roll for damage. Hold on, what was, oh God. Uh, it's like one of Nico's early interactions with Hades. Yeah, okay, I exploited that for a lot. Okay, uh, orange is will, so anything <laughs> Is will. Orange is obviously Will. Yeah, obviously. obviously. <laughs> um, and the purple was general canon relating to Camp Half Blood, Tartarus, and the Troglodytes because I knew early on those three things were very integral to. They were always planned in the outline, so I was like, "Oh, cool." So yeah, those were the the five colors and and what they meant. Um, I needed, and then so what I'm looking at right now is my notes uh, for my research when I had gotten the outline. Um, and so it's basically like I have each book and then I have in a page, a, a, like a brief summary of what the thing is on that page. 
so that I could go back to this. And so, you know, like um, for Blood of, let me look at Blood of Olympus. What do I have written down here? Oh God, the House of Hades is so long. Oh my God. <laughs> oh my God. How do I not have anything? Um, yeah, I have things like, uh, there's a mention early in this book of uh, Nico deals with how he deals with ghosts and specters and how they approach him and he doesn't know what they want. Because mm-hmm. uh, that was an early idea I had had for something yeah. to get put in there. Um, page 150, here we go. Maximum damage. Hades wishes that his son would be an exception to his children always being so unhappy. And I was like, yes. that has to be that we have to go back to that at some point. So it was <laughs> things like that where I, as I was rereading, because I read the series twice before I started right. writing was just finding these things, not only so they could be nuggets in the book, but a lot of them, like that one is so integral to understanding Nico. Like, and so, Mm -hmm. so much of a thing that is a, like a conversation I had with Rick was like, we're tying up some threads. There are things that have never been answered. There's things that have never been discussed or they've just been left open for a while. This might be our only chance to really tie up a lot of things about this one specific character. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so that was the post-it note uh, details and what, <gasps> what all of that entailed. You heard it here first, everybody. My notes are, are also <laughs> orange for Will, purple yeah. for, I think, Solangelo moments, and then okay. yellow was like canon or something. But yeah. um, was there, I know you said you read, when you first read the books, you like read them super, super quickly, like devoured them, like loved Nico off the jump. Was there like a particular moment or like a little quirk or something of Nico's where you were like, oh yes, like I get him. Like this, this, oh, this is mine. Uh, Myth of magic cards, like immediately that. Cause <laughs> I am a queer collector. Look behind me and I'm gesturing to the, all the, the nest. What you can't see that is in the other room is my massive record collection. Like that thing of like hyperfixation that a lot of us yeah. queer people have, you know, which isn't always a queer centric thing, but is something that I do relate to of this thing of like collecting it and making it sort of an extension of your personality. And I know a lot of us who had really difficult childhoods, like we poured everything into the things that we collected. So as a kid, it was, for mm-hmm. me, it was Lego um, and baseball and football cards, which is wild. Because I know a lot about those sports, but could not care about them at all. But it was the act yeah. of like I wanted the complete set. Um, well, and the guys were hot, but that was you know. Oh yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, so I mean, it was so it was real fast that I was like, "But well, thou, this is my child." Yeah. Yeah. Wow, I never thought about like that. But like as a kid, I used to say I collected collections because I was like so desperately seeking an identity and a personality. I was like, well, I collect rocks, but I also collect quarters <laughs> and also Legos. Um, and then eventually we got we got Percy Jackson, so I dropped the collections. There you go. <laughs> um, let's see. Okay, one of my favorite lines in the book is the stories were to help us on the journey, weren't they? Um, and I, I, I remember speed reading this and being like, oh my God, it's so meta. Like, you know, we're telling stories throughout the book to each other to help us. This itself is a story which is helping us, um, as readers and, um, giving us power and safety. And then that moment where we got, just, we got to thank Nico for helping all the people he helped to be themselves through his story. Um, I just was like, wow, this book carries so much weight um, did you feel like a sense of responsibility to Nico? And did that ever, was that ever like overwhelming? Every day. <laughs> I mean, you know, I mean, first context too, this wasn't my first, what's called IP or intellectual property right. book. Mm-hmm. I've written the Star Wars. Star Wars. Which I didn't have that much fear over because... I knew the Star Wars world very well, but I was also writing a property. No one had like the game isn't out until later this year. So no one had played it. And mm-hmm. even then it was like, all you have to do is here's the location. Here are the characters and a vague sense of their thing. And then just make it all up. You get to. And so I didn't have that pressure of like, I need to conform within Canon in a way that respects the Canon, but then also still does something new. Whereas this was like, like, the edges of a puzzle were already put together and then like a whole bunch of pieces. And so it's like, how do you figure out what the pieces even look like that go in between? That was Mm. a lot harder. Um, 
I will, and I, I don't know if I said it on the tour date that y'all went to, but I remember getting the outline uh, the day of, or the day after. It was real close to the, the Zoom call that I was on with Rick. And I remember reading it and being like, does he need me? Like, this is so good. Like, I, a lot of things that people are attributing to me are were in from Rick from the very beginning, including the <laughs> Gorgaira was always Rick's invention. And the yeah. idea of, of Will and Nico telling their stories to get the boat was always there. So that, none of that is me, even though I write a lot about storytelling in my books. Um, so I think that element always made me feel good, too of knowing that I wasn't going into this alone and that I was, it was like a true co-writing experience. And when I did have those moments of doubt, when I was writing the first draft, I was like, remember Mark, Rick's going to write a draft after this. And there's going to be like anything you put in here that Rick doesn't like, Rick is not going to be like, "Mm, who cares? And just leave it in there. Like there, this is a partnership. Um, Right. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I'm every day, especially after it was announced because it was announced and I was about, 16 17,000 words in and the writing that beginning part without anyone knowing what it was um was hard but at least I was like I, this is all a big secret or whatever and then it got announced mm-hmm. and then it was like everyone is looking at me please look over there don't look over <laughs> there I but I I had to just write and it was it was hard it was hard I definitely nicely muted a lot of people who were like telling me what to put in the book. Cause I was like, I can't do what you <laughs> want in the book. Yeah. But also some people, like some of the things I got through, I was like, girl, what do you think I'm going to do with that? Of course they're going to be in the book. You know, like stuff like that. But um, it just, I, you know, I, I think I spent maybe a day or two reading stuff um, and compiling screenshots of the most chaotic responses. And then I just it pretty much ignored social media because I just yeah. had to write the book and it was due mm-hmm. about a month after that announcement. Wow. Um, and so I just did what I always, I just had to treat it like it's any old book I'm writing and just, you know, you're going to have doubts and you're going to feel like maybe you didn't do the thing, the way you, it looks in your head or the way it seems on the outline. Um, but I, I just, I just kept going and yeah. my love of these characters and was like, this is a once in a lifetime opportunity. Just do like my whole mentality going into it was just do whatever you want. You're just swing wide, yeah. be ambitious, mm-hmm. put everything you've yeah. ever wanted into a Percy Jackson book in one book and just do it. And we'll figure it out later. Um, and it is wild. How many of those things stuck? Like how many <laughs> things that I, was like, I, I cannot believe this got through the editorial process. Like, so many jokes and little one-liners and really <laughs> large things that were not like it was wild how much of it <laughs> made it in before i forget one of our favorite moments was when menoides was like to nico and will uh, talking about gary and being his boyfriend and he was like oh i'm sorry are you shocked that i'm gay that I have a boyfriend? <laughs> and Nico being like, no, 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 no. That's my boyfriend. <laughs> Do you want to know what that, there's also a secondary meaning to that too, which was I wanted to have a scene where Nico and Will literally say their identities. Um, yeah. Which other, another character later does not figure it out on purpose. But mm-hmm. for, it's really important to have that um, because I know as a queer fan, how often like things just sort of dance around saying what a person is. And it's like, it's cool, but like, it would be nice if someone just said it. So I thought of the joke first and then was like, Oh, this is, this is it. Like, this is the way to have this moment where they both can be like, "Um, no, we're all a, we're all a mess and queer. So just, you know, that's not what we're freaking out about. (laughs) Your partner is just a walking nightmare. Uh, We don't know what's going on there, but yeah. Uh, another scene that I was like, well, this wasn't in the outline. Here we go. Let's go. I mean, like the Minuity scene was, but like none of the details were. And I was like, well, let me just put it in there. <laughs> oh my God. Wait, does that mean, does was anything in particular cut for time that you're allowed to talk about? <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, oh. See, this is why, so before we started recording, I said I had a list 
like my Percy Jackson, my file is called Percy Jackson Nico, because that's what I just named the folder that I was going to put all the drafts and stuff in. Um, I'm looking which one of these would be the last edit. That would be, those are copy edits. So that would be this one. We're in the archives, you guys. May 21st, 2002, I think was our last edit before we went to co copy edit. Um, is that even cut for time? Oh my God. I don't think I've been asked this question. So <laughs> maybe, no. Good. No, well, uh, nothing remotely consequential. Like yeah. it, it would be like, you know, you don't need to describe them walking to this or you don't need, you can mm. skip, <laughs> you can skip over that. Um, I'm looking at um, the document now and look, God, we edited so much. Oh my God. Um, <laughs> no, most of the gags that I put in that I can think of, I remember I was really worried that they were going to cut like early in the book when Mr. D makes popcorn and then was like walking <laughs> around talking. Uh, that I was really important. Cut, like, but I was like, I really want the image of him just like, it's drama time. Let me eat popcorn. But no, that didn't get cut. <laughs> um, no, no. Anything that was cut between the two of us were always just very tiny. We just, this is being repetitive. Like, I don't think there was a single, there was certainly nothing that I was like gutted, never made it in. Right. Like yeah. I got mm -hmm. really lucky in that, that things that I wanted made it into the final draft. Yeah. That being said, I am going to do a, a very deep read after this. And I will let you know <laughs> if I can find anything <laughs> I don't, okay. I don't think so. Yeah, like non-canon events, things no. that got they got plucked from the canon. No, um, we'll figure it out. Certainly no jokes. Certainly nothing. <laughs> no, no. It's, it's yeah. just the stuff that happens when you're writing a book where you've said the same thing twice, you said it, you don't need to say it anyway, this way again. Like, um, you know, and that was a lot of the work that both Stephanie did, and then our our copy editor at Disney, who was just helping tighten it up a little bit. Um, uh, but no, no, I think we got pretty lucky. Yeah. <laughs> now, there were many things from like the first, because I wrote the first, third, and fifth draft, and Rick did the second, fourth, and sixth. There were many things we changed of each other, like descriptions, mm -hmm. entire passages, like mm -hmm. whole heaps of things got changed. But any of the any of the stuff that people like, I'm like that. None of that was ever really changed a whole lot. Like, yeah, it was always there. <laughs> In the ether, yeah. just got plucked yeah. down. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. Carter, do you want to ask about Will? <laughs> yeah. By the way, have you guys, Carter, Mark, Mark, Carter? <laughs> <laughs> That's true. I've not been doing any of the correspondence. <laughs> uh, one of the things that we, we were discussing as we did our, you know, read through of the books, of the book singular, was that... Um, there was a lot more about Nico and Will's relationship than we necessarily were expecting before we read it, both yeah. um, in terms of them like figuring out how to navigate the relationship and talk through new challenges and learning, like learning how to talk through those new challenges instead of just like knowing and executing. But then also all of this retrospective stuff that's done that I think was even maybe a bigger surprise where everyone was like, oh, yeah. like, this is an established relationship and it'll be interesting to just kind of drop down in the middle of it, which we did, but we then also got, you know, something as detailed as like the story of when Will first realized that he was into Nico and all yeah. of those other pieces along the way that we didn't get to see with them. And I was wondering what, what the thought process was behind that and how, why, why, why you think it was like important that it was constructed yeah. that way that we get all of this, background for them so while many of the details in the book kind of came from me that's all mm -hmm. rick rick had planned so much of this stuff of 
Uh, well, Rick and Becky, actually, I'm, and now I'm thinking of a specific note when we were in the outline stage two, going back and forth, where initially in the initial outline, it was, you know, Will and Nico trade stories for, for the boat. Ex the whole mm -hmm. explanation of all of the interstitial little stories or whatever was Nico and Will trade stories with Gorgaira for a boat. And then it went to the next thing. They take the boat. They take the plunge. Like, that's how the outline went. It was not very long. Like, everything was... And then when I was like, can we build out the outline, since this is my first time writing a Percy Jackson book? <laughs> were like, yes. and, and one of the things that that both Rick and Becky sort of established was, we're thinking these need to be emotional stories. They need to be stories mm -hmm. about one or the other, maybe in relation to two or two things they have experienced. And then I was like, my thinking on it was... You know, we have the other great pairing in the book, Percy and Annabeth, which I love dearly. But so much of what has happened with them is us getting to see them interact yes. and see them yes. grow. Mm -hmm. And I love that Will and Nico became a couple, but I'm like, I want, I mean, this is the thing that we, Rick and I talked about very early on before we ever started even right now, Line is that we want Will and Nico to be treated with the same level of respect and yes. attention mm -hmm. to detail as Perkabeth. And, um, so from there, I remember, oh God, I remember being very, very nervous when we had the completed outline and it was like, I, there's a note from Becky in one of the outline things that's like, okay, Mark, you can think of this, like you can come up with this. And it was like <laughs> their first date, like first date or first kiss. How do they, you know, coming out like all, and that mm -hmm. was it. And that was all I had. Like I didn't have anything. Um, and so those were some of the harder scenes to write because the deep, the outline was not detailed. So I'd be mm. like, okay, well, let me go back and I'm holding up blood of Olympus again. Let me go back to my post-it notes and using that, those notes that I took, I basically established a timeline. Right. Here are the instances. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I would, I looked at, and this is how I wrote, came up with those stories. I'm like, where are the gaps? We know they were here mm -hmm. and here during this year, during this year, during this. Year. Okay, cool, cool, cool. We don't have this. We don't have this. We don't have this. And I just started plugging things in. And I was like, well, let's have, what's the moment, you know, Will realizes like Nico's this thing. When does Nico realize it? What about first kiss? What is, what does the kiss mean? Um, how can those things? And then the other part of it was also, how does that relate to the story we're reading? So that it didn't just right. feel like a bonus little, even though I like the idea of it being a bonus thing, like each of those things was building into this theme of, how this other person was almost like a puzzle piece for them. And they fit because each of them is caring and loving in their own way. And then our thinking with the whole book was so many books for younger people are about first love. We do have some breakup mm -hmm. books and like the end of love, but nothing mm -hmm. really, not nothing. Very little is about addressing, well, how do you stay in it? Um, yes. And so we mm -hmm. thought of this idea of Tartarus as a metaphor for relationships. And what if we had this emotional layer over everything yes. of mm -hmm. what happens when two people who already love each other and already trust each other are put through literal and metaphorical hell? How do they interact? Um, I knew mm -hmm. that also would help us so it didn't feel so repetitive of just it like it would. Obviously, I think people would have enjoyed Nico and Will being cute and loving to each other all the time. But I also <laughs> was thinking about in, in um, you know, when Percy and Annabeth were in Tartarus too, that thing of how Tartarus sort of peels back your sanity yeah. and mm -hmm. it makes you very raw and terrified. And, and I was like, we, even though Nico is experienced and has an advantage here, I was like, there also needs to be, strife and that strife should feed on their like existing insecurities about themselves and their role in mm -hmm. a relationship um mm -hmm. so you know detail what again detail wise i came up with what each of these things were i i have had it okay so I've, i'll tell you this too i've never i've never said it <laughs> i've had an idea where someone wanted to have a party and or like wanted to the, the whole like i accidentally came up to the whole camp yeah. i have had <laughs> where I wanted to write a book. Like it was one of the many book ideas, but of like someone accidentally coming out to everyone at like a party because they didn't know it was going to be a party. And then they felt pressured and it was going to be this whole thing, but I couldn't think of how to make it a whole book. Mm -hmm. I, like, mm -hmm. I feel like it's part of a book or maybe a scene in the middle of a book. I could, and it just, 
I was like, this is it. It fits perfect right here. Of course, <laughs> Evo would do something like this. And of course, the nymphs would be overjoyed to set up this party for him. Like, you know, um, but it, it, it also achieved a very logistical thing, which is how did the rest of the camp find out? Right. Mm-hmm. We're at a point where we know everyone knows. So how did everyone know? And so, so yeah, it, uh, a lot of this was extremely thought out. There was almost nothing that was sort of improvised at the last second. Rick and I were like, we have to be careful in that, you know, respectful way about how we're developing their past, how it's going to show up. Um, and so the last thing I will say is I was the one who came up with the idea to have the narrative happen out of order. Right. Because right. I outline it was you get to Gorgaira, they tell stories. And I was like, I think if we just stop, and all those stories happen at once, people are going to be like, the book just comes yeah. sort of to a stop. And yeah. even though the things in it might be great, like I was like, there's no tension. So I was like, well, what if they're like little snippets and you're getting them out of order and kind of not understanding. And then then that was fun because then Rick started putting in all those things about like, let's make a reference to Will bleeding because we're evil. You know, like, let's make a reference <laughs> to Will suffering because something happened prior to this. So it's yeah. that, like building tension. And so... Mm-hmm. You know, um, it worked out really well and allowed us to sort of structure the book in a way that a Percy Jackson book hasn't been yes, structured, which was sure. satisfying on a creative level. But um, and that is so meta and self referential to the yeah. the mission of the book itself, mm-hmm. which is just brilliant and we i have to say we did a whole like solangelo like deep dive like predictions like what do we think might happen what do we think oh, their relationship right. is going to look like and we were so vindicated like we literally were like well will is a healer and he's really going to struggle with like letting nico embrace his darkness and then when i was reading i was like oh my god oh my god mark gets it so hard like mark and rick like we're all on the same page about the struggle of this relationship and what that's going to look like um but we Kurt, i don't know i feel like we need to tell mark how much we appreciated the well, before we jump, can I ask, because no one, I haven't been able to sit down with like a Percy Jackson fan and talk about this. What other predictions did you have? Like, did anything, <laughs> like, because you talked about like Cart- mentioning like the surprises, the things that yeah. people did mm-hmm. not expect, the deep dive. I know the other one, almost everyone who I have gotten to like, when I do book signings or whatever, they were like, I didn't expect the flashback to Nico's time in Charters at all. Mm-hmm. Like, fully thought mm-hmm. that that was never be explained and that was done for that was the only improv thing i think in the whole book that i came up with oh wow it was not at all and i was running into this really difficult problem um and i talked i talked about it a few nights on tour but like as i was writing a scene i'd have to have nico stop and be like well from my last time in charter it's very matter of fact (laughs) and it's getting annoyed because i was like this dynamic is making Will seem incompetent and unknowledgeable mm-hmm. in a way that isn't fair to who he is as a character. And so mm-hmm. I was like, oh God. I just remember getting this idea. I actually had to go back and rewrite a whole portion of the book to fit that flashback where it was, but it solved mm-hmm. the problem because once right. Nico told Will and the other Trogs, here is what happened. I think mm-hmm. I know who this is. It, it oh God, narratively like took a huge weight off of me. So yes. that was fully improv. I pulled that mm-hmm. out of nothing. And then just like, ooh, this, I got to bring Nemesis was never in the outline either. And that's oh, when we love her. Pulled it in. And I was like, of course, <laughs> of course. And anyway, um, so what other a great figure for Nico? Yeah, I know. Uh, what other, do you, like, can you share? Whatever? I remember, I remember specifically, I don't think, I don't know what the discourse was before we got like an image of the book, but I remember as soon as like there was an image of the book yeah. itself that like Rick put on the internet, everyone was like, oh, the dark pages in the middle, that's Nico and Tartarus. Like, I okay. feel okay. 100%. Yeah. In our conversation, we could literally listen back to this um, and, and pull this up, which we did not do right before this, but um, I think we did predict a lot about the Nico and Will dynamic at a high level and specifically the um, idea about Nico's um, re-experience of trauma being uh, an important thing for them to process in the context of a relationship. A lot of the other things I would say we were way off on. Um, (laughs) We, um, I don't know if we should say this or if this is going to get anybody in trouble. I don't think it will. We we were like, <laughs> is this going to be where Rick launches the multiverse? And then it kind of oh. was not. Um, <laughs> oh my God. Yeah. When, I t- 
we were deep I, in the Riordan verse of Madness series, and we still are. <laughs> I do remember seeing tweets about like tweets and stuff like that. And I, I also get that too, because it's like we're revisiting characters and scenes. Yeah. But I think spiritually we achieved that with the weird dream sequences at the beginning of like, because I I, I think people, I remember someone tweeting mm. it of like, oh, I think the multiverse is going to happen because how else are we going to revisit things from Nico's childhood? Oh. And, oh. and so, but that was the function of those, well, actually not entirely. I was going to say that was the function of the dream things. The function of the dream things was also so I could show off and show Rick. Yeah. Because I, I wrote those in my, in my audition. And so that was me being like, <laughs> I'm gonna take it. So I'm gonna take cannon and twist yeah. it and make it warped. Um, you know, um, we were like, we were for that. <clears throat> We were trying to figure out who was calling to Nico, and we were like, it's too easy for it to be Bob. It can't be Bob. Like, who's what? calling to Nico? And our prevailing theory was that it was Nico calling to Nico. We were very wrong about that. But, like, we love the movie <laughs> Frozen 2. And we were like, if Nico is hearing this voice, like, into the unknown, calling to him this whole time, and then he gets there and he realizes it's him, and he, yeah. like, is able to embrace himself, we were like, show yourself from Frozen 2. But this was great, too. <laughs> <laughs> I fully get that. I also, I I love the idea, and again, this was mostly Rick, of it being a dual meaning. That Bob really was reaching out, but right. like, he, you know, the assumption that also the dreams and this like thing taunting him was sort mm -hmm. of like, oh, duh, like this is all sort of attached to it or whatever like that. But I, I, I also wanted Nico's acceptance to be both external and internal at the end. Yeah. And that was achieved again, fully Rick's idea, the Cocoa Puffs. Like, yeah. the, <laughs> like I remember reading that and being like, you mother, like just be like, <laughs> this idea, because wouldn't so many of us who've been through childhood trauma love to externalize our negative emotions, but then also that, that the power in that metaphor of like, they don't leave you. Like, cause we, mm -hmm. it wasn't yeah. like cure. It wasn't saying you cure trauma and then you're just better. Like you're healed. That's fine. Yeah. But finding a way to like accept yourself and love yourself. And then trauma just looks different. I mean, in this case, they look like little ink yeah. dots and they're cuddly. Um, but like, <laughs> I don't know. I, I, I was really like this idea that it didn't actually come from him and he, Nico had to choose himself. Um, mm -hmm. But I, yeah. I, Fully get why someone would be like, "Oh yeah, it's Nico calling to himself." <laughs> One of those. <laughs> yeah, um, I love that. That and Reina probably I think was the other big thing we were like, "Oh, Reina's gonna, Reina's gonna show up, and Reina's gonna guide them like the big oh, sister." <laughs> there were so many characters and things I wanted to do that never even made it even as a suggestion in the outline, like you know. Yeah. Because at, at some point the book was just so full, I was like, yeah. I don't yeah. want this to be a parade of every character who's ever existed. Even though no. I would have loved, it. like, I would have loved writing. <laughs> I was like, I really need to focus on certain yeah. people, which was like a big thing too. That um, wasn't improvised, but I did add in was the Piper scene at the end. I was like, mm. this is well, actually the duel, the actual double Piper scene, and then the. Are we assuming everyone listening to this is fully in the spoilers? 100%, yes. yes. They've yes. read the book. At this point, that's their, that's on them. Hades, Hades <laughs> gift um, in the end. Mm -hmm. Like, I was like, emotional things that just need to be, like, tied up. Yeah. Um, and so, like, yeah, I actually would have loved to have Raina in the book. I would have loved to have Hazel in the book. I would have loved to mm -hmm. see... I because I'm selfish, I just want to find any way to get Leo back anywhere. Like anywhere you <laughs> me personally. Who cares if it's in the book? Just come hang out with me, Leo. I love you. You're my <laughs> son as well. I, you know, but you know, we had to make those executive choices extremely early on about what is the focus of the book and who yeah. gets to be in it. Um mm -hmm. and not and making sure it didn't feel so crowded that the people who do show up don't get enough time, that they're just there. Mm -hmm. Like the yeah. big people who it was fun to do was like like Gary on like and not even having him on the page but just having mentioned yeah this idea of building into the theme that people can change and they're not who they were hundreds thousands of years or how well he wasn't he was pretty terrible like three years ago but you know <laughs> <laughs> yeah um, whereas it's like well 
if Piper's going to show up, we need something a little bigger. If this person's going to, you know, like it was like, Mm -hmm. it's delicate. It's again, the puzzle. How do you fit everything in here and make sure the piece looks the way it should? Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's hard. Uh, Not easy. We (laughs) we were trying to figure out a way to like talk about the, the Piper scene and also the, the dream, the dream vision gift of Hades at the end. But like, Uh, we were just like such big fans of the Piper. We like just talked about it last night. Um, with Karen from Prophecy Radio, um, who is so awesome. <laughs> and we were just like, yeah, like, but that makes so much sense hearing what you said about um, giving the opportunity for Nico and Will to label themselves, but then giving Piper the opportunity to be a big old queer mess, quote unquote. And that, I mean, as someone who initially identified as bisexual and then mm-hmm. gay, and then, I mean, this was in rapid order. It was bisexual for like a month. And then it was, you know, and, and I should also give context for it because I think there is an actual biphobic trope of mm-hmm. having someone who is bisexual, they just name it because they're actually gay or they get confused yeah, for it. Yeah, 100%. Mm-hmm. Names themselves as bisexual and then every character around them just calls them gay. And it's like, no, that's not what it is. I also know that there are some places where that comes from when, where and when I came out bisexuality was actually weirdly safer because it meant I was mm-hmm. still into women. So people were like, you're not as weird as those mm-hmm. people. And mm-hmm. then I got to college. I went to Cal State Long Beach, one of the gayest colleges in the world. <laughs> <laughs> and it was there about two or three months in when I started attending like the campus like queer group that I was like, wait, this word is way better. I love this word. And this mm-hmm. word was absolutely a slur growing up. And I love this idea of reclaiming it. So it was this thing of like, even mm-hmm. at... 18, 19, I, was, I didn't even get to 20 before I started calling myself queer. That idea that identities change because maybe you find the one that fits you and the one that you can latch onto. And so given that this was a book about fluidity and it was a book about like understanding who you are and sometimes not understanding who you are, I really mm-hmm. love this chance to be like, Piper absolutely loved Jason I think in years to come, like as she gets older, like many of us do, she may may be able to understand what that love means. Yeah. Um, Mm -hmm. Because I think about like the girls I loved in in middle school and high school, and it was just that, oh, I just wanted to be really good friends with them. Like, and, you know, I I had a girlfriend once for like a month (laughs) in high school. And I wanted, I just wanted her to like me. I had no interest in any of the other stuff that came with being like a boyfriend to a girl. Um, And so I think about that. A lot of us who are in that weird middle space where we don't have all of the information about us. And sometimes it takes experience or sometimes it just takes meeting another queer person who says the thing Mm -hmm. that you've been waiting your whole life to hear. All Mm -hmm. I knew though, was that Piper was with Shell. And that needs to be addressed. And so I- Come on girl. Like, (laughs) I love this chance to be like, I love this person, but now I love this person and I don't know what it makes me. And mm-hmm. Nico, after this journey, getting to be like, you don't, you don't have to figure it out. Like you really don't, yeah. you don't have to like this second and hopefully relieving. I mean, going back to what you're talking about, how the book is a meta conversation too. I think that was me thinking mm-hmm. of that as well of like, I just want to relieve pressure off of so many people who are struggling to find out who they are in this mm-hmm. sometimes terrible, messy world, like mm-hmm. look to this fictional character who also doesn't know and is still very mm-hmm. happy and we'll figure yeah. it out. And we'll figure it out with her wonderful girlfriend who I loved getting to write a little <laughs> bit more. Like, show! Uh, it was it was great. So show you know, with the nose ring. Yeah, with the nose <laughs> ring. Uh, she loves hiking. Yeah, that was it was it, that was a very You'll hear writers talk about, but it's true. This is a very selfish thing that I wrote. I want I wrote it for mm-hmm. myself, thinking of like 16, 17 year old, 18 year old me. And I'm like, I just wanted someone to say, it's okay, you don't know. You don't know what yeah. works. You don't mm-hmm. know who you are or what you're going to be. It's it's okay. Oh, and for that yeah. to come like at and to and through Piper in particular, who is a character that like we have really like spent so much time with 
yeah. in our reread of these books on the podcast going from like, oh, like Piper was like the girl's girl when we were like in early high school and being like, what does this mean? And like, why is she like so not into makeup? And like, how did that contribute to my like so not into makeup right. personality? And then watching her go for Jason and us being like confused. But she just has such, been on such a weird and confusing journey that she still gets to kind of like be given like some freedom to just explore. Yeah. I think it's so mm-hmm. wonderful especially for fans to be able to kind of settle the debate of like arguing over uh, yeah. what she should identify as. Which I, yeah. I do, I, I do want to say, I do understand that. And I do. Yeah, absolutely. As a creator, the power of representation. I mean, referring to the conversation we we're having earlier about having Will and Nico actually say who they are. I do think that's yeah. important. I also wanted to make sure to leave it also open a little bit. Like mm-hmm. I hope I get to do this again. I don't know if Rick will ever write with another person, but like, wouldn't it be great if like a queer woman gets to write a Piper book? Like, and I don't <laughs> think of like, maybe I shouldn't be the one to define who she is. Like maybe yeah. someone mm-hmm. who has been through an experience like that can be the one to write that story. So this for me also felt like, like a more ethical way to approach who she is. Yeah. Is for this sense of like some confirmation from someone she respects and adores of like Mm -hmm. who are allowed to not know while Mm -hmm. also like this is not piper's book i want her like yeah Yeah. right a million other characters you know like but like it's just like again that delicate balance of figuring out this canon is so rich and so detailed what makes the most sense in this book and i i also love that piper that piper scene just tied in the general theme of the sun and the star and like yeah. just 100%. I, I, I'm a big thematic person. I like things to, you know, maybe sometimes they're a brick over the head, but like I do like them <laughs> to feel like they're everything is thematically tied in some way in this very complicated web. Oh yeah. The amount of times we've said in the last like 12 episode run, like there's that theme. Here's that theme. These two <laughs> themes are intertwining. <laughs> Much like the ball of thread that connects the two of them forever. <laughs> um, is that our tie-in to ask about monstrosity, maybe? Um, <laughs> Go for it. This was the other thing that we also, like, in our predictions episode, I think we probably said as well that this is going to be the book where we get the most satisfying answer, resolution, meditation. discussion, yeah. meditation on the question of what it means to be a monster and how to understand the like value and like selfhood of a being that like explodes into dust in the context of this world. Um, Mm -hmm. And I think that that was like mostly true. Like we did, there were so, so much of Nico and Will's journey was about their like different relationships to this. And then at the end, Nico very viscerally being like, don't, don't, don't kill the demons. Um, Yeah. Because they're my children. We were like, and go rescue Amphithemus from yeah. whatever Don't he's rescue got going Amphithemus, on. stop the boat to let the demons in. You know, we, we really <laughs> wanted to ask about what the, yeah, like what the thought process was behind that and how, I don't know, like how, how you approach that in the context of the amount of lore that we have going into this about like what it means to be a monster in this world of storytelling. And also just, I guess in the context of telling a story to children about, about like change and what it is and the to, relationship to be between good. queerness and monstrosity in fiction but, yeah there are like so many things where we we're like this is gonna be the perfect opportunity and it came through and we wanted to just talk go, to you go, about go, that go, go. <laughs> yeah, like that's my contribute i will so let me start with this so much of it is rick like and it, it and it was it was one of the many things when i read that original outline where i was like does he need me to write this book like are you kidding me but he so much it. of the like let's challenge monstrosity through Will and Nico was there, like was there and just like, Oh God, I just, I loved it because the, one of the things that's so, as you both know, what's so satisfying about reading Percy Jackson from the beginning through is how Rick is willing to challenge his own mythology and complicate it. Even if the complication was like, well, Oh God, what are the implications of it? It's like, well, we're going to deal with it. And that thing of like, Mm -hmm. instead of rigidly sticking to canon and never allowing anything to change or grow. I think if anything, this was a book where we were like, canon is gonna have to grow a lot because it mm-hmm. is around the two characters who have such a 
a fervent fan base and who also deserve a story about change. I mean, at the at the heart of it is Bob. Yeah. Like yeah. this character mm-hmm. who, again, without any of my help or input, Rick wrote <laughs> as you can change. You can choose to be a new person and have a new set of morals and ethics and choose to reject your entire past. So that was always, always at the heart of this book um, and was mm-hmm. for me probably the most exciting aspect of thinking about the book. When I just got the outline, I was like, I want to write mm-hmm. this because of this. And then that's mm-hmm. what you said, Erica, that's where I came in is as a queer person, like I'm obsessed with monsters and I've always been obsessed with monsters and also obsessed with villains. Mm-hmm. And I really, I'm putting <laughs> this out here universe. I haven't figured out the vehicle for it, but I want to write a queer villain book so bad. I think it yeah. might <laughs> way number five. I'm working on YA number four and it's definitely not that. But I really want to write a queer villain as the main character so bad. Can't uh, wait. Because I am obsessed with the way that the world that we live in uh, assigns villainry to us. So F it. Let's be villains. Let's be monstrous or whatnot. <laughs> um, and so I wanted to do that sort of this subtextual experience with it where you are getting to meet monsters and demons and gods who may seem on the face one thing and then flip. I loved, by Mm -hmm. the way, getting to do all the stuff we did with Nemesis and Hypnos Uh, and like mm -hmm. getting to like explore that they're complicated and they have their own willpowers and maybe they're not beholden to the person who has literally more power to them or who who is their Mm -hmm. mother in this case. Mm -hmm. Um, Mother. You have this... Mother, okay. <laughs> Mother. You have, what a very queer thing too, to reject your blood family because they don't treat you well and find your own. So you mm-hmm. have family, which is intertwined with the, you know, the exploration of uh, monstrosity. You have a subtextual examination of it with Menoides, but then the subtext is literally text because he's also queer. And that was a thing, too, is I was like, well, if we're going to do this, someone has to literally be queer. And that's sort of the inroad that I then found that and then found a way to get Will and Nico to talk about who they are. Um, Mm -hmm. It also is um, a big reason why it was very important to me, because when you talk about monstrosity, we have to talk about humans who are viewed as monsters. So Mm -hmm. knowing that Nico would get hurt and actually not having him magically repaired was a huge thing for me because it is a very big ableist trope of like anyone who is disfigured or who has very large scarring or whatnot is usually seen as a villain or negative person. Mm -hmm. Um, It's terrible. And I love that idea of also exploring it literally through Nico, through this character who has powers that are, you know, associated with negative things in the outside world. So Mm -hmm. it was, it was, I think that's where the partnership worked. The core idea is Rick through and through. And then it was like, let me put my queer frosting all over this cupcake. You know, like, let me twist <laughs> these things and find new ways to sort of bring different things out. Um, and so, you know, I, I think that also comes, you know, I've been talking earlier about the Cocoa Puffs and how I wanted to make sure that they also weren't magical healing, which was so important to have mm-hmm. people be like, oh, they have to come with us. Because for me, that was both a queer metaphor and a metaphor of saying you don't magically heal your trauma. Your trauma is always going to mm-hmm. be there. Mm-hmm. The part of the healing process, you know, is learning how to live with it differently. Um, mm-hmm. so- and also to take care of them. Like I was so hit in the face by Nico being mother to his own little trauma babies, yeah. like being able to himself be mother to like his past self and to look at himself as like, and his past lives as his own family and all of that, mm-hmm. that he carries with him and like experience like this, like maternal sense of love for oh, the little I'm person he used to be. The heart when I tell you this now, cause I haven't been able to talk about it cause I can't talk about spoilers when I do events. One of the key things in doing work to heal from complex PTSD is loving your inner child. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So it's literally loving his inner child, children, yeah. plural. Yeah. I remember plural. my friend and they were like, I'm going to, I'm going to destroy you. I hate you. Oh, how <laughs> dare you? And I was like, but it is like, it is literally Nico doing that. Um, yeah. So yeah, it was, it, uh, again, like, I, it's weird because I think the answer to most of these questions is Rick and I thought everything out 
with such intent. Like, I mean, it is why it took from, I, I got the call like, Hey, this is going through. It's real. He, we're doing a contract in April of 2021. And we did not finish, finish the book until, wait, I can look, I can tell you when this last round of copy edits went. <laughs> uh, cover. Oh my God. October 27, 2022 third pass um so a year a year and so, yeah 18 months 18 months back and forth with very few breaks in between like we it was you know the other, the other thing is stephanie is such a wonderful and also very quick editor so i'm used to sometimes like turning in edits and it's like oh you're not gonna get anything for like a month and it would be right. like uh, like a week later and i'd be i'm like help i need a help. <laughs> I'm so Stephanie. So, uh, deep, deep thought into yeah. practically everything. Yeah. And it and it and it showed and it read. And and whose idea was it for Stephanie to play Gorgyra on the book tour? I have to know. I need you all to know <laughs> that I knew she was gonna do it, but if you saw me in Boston and New York, I, that those my reaction, I could not handle it. I was a man <laughs> because I had never heard the accent. <laughs> At all, I didn't know it was going to be an accent. I didn't know any of that was going to happen. So, like anyone, anyone who's listening, and you were at the Boston <laughs> event, you all watched me lose my mind live because I was like, "What is this?" And like, I, I think the idea came from. I want to say it was Stephanie who thought of it, but how it was explained to me was like. It's, you know, this whole book and this whole tour was kind of meta. Let's add another layer mm-hmm. to it, um, yeah. which is really silly, bizarre, fun way to sort of guide the conversation. Um, I didn't even see the outfit until about 30 minutes before we went on. And it was so smart because they had like the faces and the dress. It was so well thought of and it broke me. Like it just yeah. was, uh, so I <laughs> I who came up with that yeah it's a big highlight of my oh. life um <laughs> but also like it added such a rich layer onto our reading of the book like having gotten to experience yeah. that and gotten to think about Gorgiver as the editor of will and nico's story um yeah. and also as like a stand-in for the readers every time they would like go through one of their memories and it would like pan back to Gorgiver and she would be crying be like that was so <laughs> sweet <laughs> <sighs> okay um i think it is time in our in our final time here to talk about oh, Paramore. Do you have other okay, questions? Okay, okay. Well, oh, we do. No. We have lots. Okay, we need cool. to talk about Paramore. I wore my shirt. Um, <laughs> we need to talk. <laughs> <laughs> because first we get the whole Nico and the Cocoa Puffs. They're opening for Paramore this winter. And then like a few pages later, it's the end of the book. And I was like, wow, this really feels like a distinct... Um, allusion to one of the greatest songs of all time, Last Hope by Paramore from the 2013 self-titled album. <laughs> um, and I remember reaching out to you and being like, yeah, this is really like, and wow. You like- were the first person to realize how it was a very direct <laughs> to that song. What, like a, a song that has, God, well, I mean, when you talk about art, like I have such an interesting journey with Paramore too, because mm-hmm. I didn't initially listen to them when Riot came out because mm-hmm. I used to run, before I was a author, I used to be a community manager for this website called BuzzNet. And BuzzNet ended up buying Friends or Enemies, which was the Fueled by Ramen, like, social media website. So I oh. ran all of that stuff. So I was every day interacting. Like, I got to, I met all of those bands, like, multiple times. Um, and I'm sure none of them remember <gasps> me at all. Like, at all. Whoa. Uh, all of my Panic at the Disco, you know, Paramore, uh, uh, the Academy is uh, uh, oh, Ultimate Oh, mm-hmm. those that was a different that was a different label, but like that era of like pop punk or whatever. Um, and I didn't listen to them. <laughs> this is so complicated too because I had to moderate like the worst of their fandoms because my job was to moderate, and so mm-hmm. I would see the worst of the worst. And it was just this thing where I was like, I can't listen to these bands because some of their fans are so terrible. Yeah. Well, my job mm. was to make it so that the fans who were participating in all this community stuff were having a good time. But it was that thing of like, I am too close to this. I can't listen to it. I also remember being uh, the last song on Riot. 
um, Born for This, mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. has a reference to one of my favorite hardcore bands of all time, Refused. Um, we want our airwaves back. It's a reference yeah. to a song. And I also remember being like very much in that space of like gatekeepy, like, well, how do you know what Refused is? Um, and then got <laughs> by someone like a week later and was like, how dare you? Don't do that, Mark. And I was like, okay, I'm sorry. So I was in this space where I didn't listen to it anymore until right before that album, before the self-title came out. Um, and then I, I just, Misery Business came on a mix. Like I had a pop punk mix I was listening to and it came on and I was like, this is a banger. I don't care. Like, this is <laughs> such a good song. I love it. Let me revisit. I got to go back. And so I had never listened to, uh, what was the one after Riot? Um, it has Brick Bright, Brand New Eyes. All brand New Eyes. Never listened to it. Yeah. I had never listened to it at all. Listened to it and was like, oh, so this is my whole personality now. Like, I've been missing out this whole time. <laughs> Misguided Ghosts is like my favorite Nico D'Angelo song. <laughs> uh, so, like many, there are a few artists in the world who have just captured me, like, deeply and truly, like Paramore, Beyonce, Florence and the Machine, Bad Religion. Uh, Whoa. Uh, <laughs> like, I very all over the sort of the map taste. But with Paramore in particular... It is, here is this deeply emotional and poetic singer, songwriter um, with a band, like her band has always been, God, it's so good. Like such good musicians, but you know, especially this current iteration too. And also mm-hmm. watching like Haley's, but not, I won't just say Haley because it is the, definitely group ever, but seeing the group's politics change with the times too has been really mm-hmm. rewarding. Um, mm-hmm. But that song in particular um, is just, it just for me, I don't always think of my fictional characters or someone else's fictional characters as inhabiting a song all of the time. But I was like, it is the most Nico coded song I could possibly imagine. Oh. <laughs> when I was writing the ending, was thinking of this idea of like, this is like, this is it. Like I, things have been awful. Things have been terrible in my life, but like, what is the hope that I choose to cling to? Um, mm-hmm. And so there's a very, I thought it would be very direct reference to that song. And everyone <laughs> did it. But until you messaged me, Erica, no one had ever said anything. I mean, I will also say there are about 20 music references littered throughout this book that no mm-hmm. one has caught at all because they're really, really <laughs> obscure. Like references to different like hardcore bands or like, and yeah. stuff like that that no one has ever caught. Um, but I thought that one was really on the nose and someone was going to be like, is this is this this But confirming for all of them <laughs> what i was i listened to that song on repeat as i was writing that last chapter like i i, wow. I write to music fully I, yeah. I, don't like, I don't like silence um and so i have very elaborate playlists and stuff but that was in one thing i just listened to that on loop while i wrote it i think i wrote it in key west florida uh i remember on the balcony of my hotel um and just had it on my speaker and just had it on a loop and sorry to everyone staying at that resort. <laughs> you had to hear it like 30 times because it did take me a hot minute to write that last chapter. No, you cultured them. You showed <laughs> yeah, them. Yeah, they should be so lucky. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and it's not that I don't feel the pain. It's just I'm not afraid of hurting anymore. <laughs> this like the entirety of, of this it, book. Yeah. yeah. Oh my God. Well, that's good to know. Yeah, we... <laughs> We very much like went, like before the book came out, we were like, okay, let's make a chronological. We've done a lot of playlists throughout our time on the show, and we have like an old Nico D'Angelo playlist. But like, we we're like, let's drop in and do a playlist that is chronological to Nico's life. Mm-hmm. So it starts with Italian like music Italian opera. from the 1940s, <laughs> yeah. and then it goes through all the stages of his life until up until the book. And then the second I finished the book, I was like, okay, Last Hope was already on there, but I dragged it to the very end, so it's like <laughs> matches the very end of the book. <laughs> Yeah. I'm trying to think what other songs were like really instrumental. Yeah. In the writing of the book. Um, you should release a playlist uh, of the music you listen to. I, so here's the thing. I'm extremely protective over my playlists. I've never released <gasps> one for any of my books. And I, I don't, I, I'm, I'm thinking about learning to let go of that. I think for me, it's mm. such an integral part of the creation process, but just thinking mm. right now, um, um, uh okay uh that's what i want by little nas x was i've listened to that a billion times there's a song on how big how you how beautiful it comes after queen of peace um of storms wow. and, what is it called? what is that song 
Barry Storms and Saints. Barry Storms and Saints. That's a real Please. album. Wow. <laughs> Please do that song. I, I, oh, there is a particular line in that song that is like my, like my guiding force for Nico a lot. Um, uh, what is the, it's, um, oh God, now I have to look at it because I, I don't even know my own, my own favorite song. <laughs> uh, it is, oh my gosh. Oh, what an album. Oh yeah, I know it seems like forever. I know it seems like an age, but one day this will be over. I swear it's not so far away. And just for me, that longing that Nico feels all the time, I was like, this is his song. Um, so yeah, I, I do write to very elaborate playlists. Yeah. Um, with the exception of like, if a certain album has sort of taken over my life, then I'll be listening to that while I'm writing. But um, but yes, this is all to confirm that all that. When you, if you're catching music references, they're probably deeply intentional yeah. on my part. Uh, I can't believe that you were like moderating the Fueled by Ramen internet culture <laughs> at the time when I was probably obsessing over Fueled by Ramen. Because I was. <laughs> I, it is a very strange time of my life. Very strange and wonderful. So I, you know, that was the job that led me back into writing. I started, I became a, you know, music journalist and a pop culture writer, which then led to the creation of Mark Reads and Mark Watches, which right. then led to writing books. Like, so it's like, that was a very important time in my life, but also yeah. seems like 7 million years ago. <laughs> yeah, I, I, yeah, I went on so many tours and like, it was, oh God, it was very strange. Anyway. Oh my gosh. Okay, wow. Well then, speaking of of music, we'll just go like a few more minutes. Um, okay. um, 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 uh, the, 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 the what um was there any other besides music like other pieces of media that really inspired um your like perspective on nico or on this book Ooh. um not directly um but when i had sort of pitched this idea that gargiver stories would happen out of order mm -hmm. um and knowing where they converged, I was kind of thinking of the last five years. Um, Whoa! Stop it! Stop oh it! Oh my god! <laughs> you know what makes me crazy? I'm sorry. Can I say this? You know what makes me nuts? <laughs> because, because I knew structure-wise, we couldn't do a chronological book like an, any of the other yeah. Percy Jackson. But I was also thinking of the convergence point. And what I'm so obsessed with, with like the structure of that musical is absolutely out of this world. So it was thinking of, well, we have this story that is happening in chronological order, but then we have this thing that's like basically like looping around and, and uh -huh. where, so thinking where those stories happen um, and how do we lead to the convergence point? So it makes sense. Cause it also had to involve thinking of the stories that they tell and I, cause I had an idea of like, well, do those happen in order? Or do they, do we just get random bits and pieces? And I wanted it so that like with, um, the first five years or the it's first five years, right? Last, last five, five years. years. The last five years. Yeah, right, right. Yeah. Sorry. I got confused. Um, where you can still pull that apart and you have a chronological story, right? You can yeah. pull each of them. Yeah. And so I wanted it so that if you could, you could assemble a version of it where, the story happens, they get to Gorgaira, you could actually put the stories in order um, so that all of those interstitials, if you put them in order, it, it doesn't feel like it's jumping around. It actually is a full scene. Uh, it's just mm -hmm. a very long scene that's then split up. Um, so yeah, that is the completely <laughs> unhinged thing I was thinking about when I- Mark. <laughs> I'm oh, sorry. Wow. I know you keep naming things no, that's and an pieces amazing and reference. songs and media <laughs> that were like integral to our lives as middle schoolers when we first met. Like we had playlists that were just Florence and the Machine and the last five years. And we were listening them to, to them together. You know, like that. It's, it's a whole thing. It's a whole, it's a whole, it's a whole thing. thing. Okay. We have two um, very last questions. One is quirky. Oh, oh sorry. Do you have to. I, I think that the other big thing I was thinking of was. Um... Oh my God. It's gone. It's gone. 
one. I'll think of it. I'll think you of it. it. You'll get it. You'll get it. Yeah. No, no, no. Yeah. Just ask <laughs> okay. I'll think of it. La- last questions. One is silly. One is very serious. Um, the first one is <laughs> what is making you happy right now? So do you have any like big media wrecks you want to toss out there? Albums? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, because I have turned on so many of my friends to the show and it is certainly not for children at all. So I'm going to put a warning. It is 100% for adults. Um, Couples therapy on Showtime is my entire personality right now. It is doing the most amazing work to destigmatize or destigmatize what therapy actually is and what therapy looks like. And it is it is a very caring, loving documentary. Each season is just four couples, and you just ex- watch their sessions, and it's done so well. I am obsessed with it and it just has filled my heart with so much love to see people. Oh, wow. Because the thing is a lot of people enter it because they've seen clips on social media where it looks like, like, ooh, this seems a little gossipy and like, oh, I'm going to get the dirt and I'm mm-hmm. heavily invested in these things. But when you watch the show in order, it does this, like there's, I always tell people, if you're going to watch couples, ther- if you're going to watch couples therapy, there is going to be a couple every season where one of the partners you will want to bury in the deepest pits of hell. You will hate everything <laughs> about them. And you want to destroy them. And the beauty of the show is them using the show to peel back the layers of a person to show that even people who do do terrible things, and there are people on that show who've done terrible things, they deserve attention and love. And there is a beautiful thing that happens when you are in a space and you feel safe and you feel like you could actually talk about who you, uh, uh, so that, uh, that, and, um, and it has been my love for the last year and continues to be, but Beyonce's Renaissance is everything. Oh, to me. absolutely. I, I'm going I to saw her in, stop in Toronto. like a week. <laughs> yeah. I saw her in Toronto and then got home because I couldn't see her in Atlanta because it sold out so fast. And I got home. Oh no, not missing the Atlanta Toronto. show. Well, hold on. Within 24 hours, I bought a ticket to Atlanta. <gasps> so, and I was mostly like the for almost the back of the very top or whatever. And I also got to go to the show where she played the full album for the first time. Yeah, it, I lucked out. It was amazing, and I I can't stop listening to it. It's just filled my life with so much joy. Oh my god excellent rex um (laughs) all right as we said last question here it's very serious um the central premise of our podcast is asking the question is persebeth the greatest love story ever told um we have here the writer and mantle holder of solangelo (laughs) um so i do think we have to ask um two-parter okay um is persebeth the greatest love story ever told slash what do you think is one of your most iconic great love story ships um, that maybe means something to you of of equally of what Persebeth may mean. Um, My (laughs) my personal, like I will go to the ends of the earth is Will and Lyra in his dark materials. Like I am obsessed Ob- that's so like obsessed with Will and Lyra and then also deeply loved what the show did for the two of them as well I really the the HBO adaptation if you're curious it is absolutely phenomenal yeah. and nails pretty much everything they do not shy away from what the book is about um so like I think about them so th- that's like my kid lit my YA version of yeah, it is yeah. it it's Mulder and Scully like for me, Mulder and Scully is the greatest love, oh, love story of all time. Wow. I grew up on the X Files. I grew up on the X Files. And because for me, it's that deep, slow burn into love and then into separation and then into back in love again. And there's just oh. something about their dynamic that was copied the world over. Like there's so many shows that copy the Wilder, uh, Wilder the Mulder and Scully dynamic, like to a T. And I think it's because, like, that's the blueprint. Um, I personally have to say that I believe in Solangelo supremacy. So I'm just, yeah. I'm just, <laughs> that's, Mark, a good, that's a very good, fair answer. I, Shout out to if that. If you did it, I think it'd be a I problem. Know, I feel like I wrote a whole book about it. So maybe that's how that <laughs> That's what I I expect nothing less. <laughs> but I will say this too. It's that I absolutely modeled a lot of things about Nico and Will. I, I think a lot of their struggle in Tartarus doesn't happen without Perkabeth and Tartarus. Yeah. It just doesn't. It just doesn't. And I had to think of it that way 
So even if I'm Solangelo's supremacy, I'm like, there is a stone that is underneath them that they are standing upon. So I. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Hell yeah. Oh my God. Mark, thank you so much thank for you. coming here. Of course. Uh, thank you for this for... conversation. I have been dying to talk about spoilers. Like, dying. <laughs> <laughs> it is so not fair because, like, it is the weird reality of being, you know, on tour and promoting yeah. the book. You're rarely in situations where you're like, let's let loose and yeah. talk about mm-hmm. the details. Like, I would have never gotten to talk about you know, Florence and Paramore and, and the last five years, like those are things I've been wanting to talk about, but it's, yes. <laughs> mean. so thank you for giving me this space and making it so joyous and celebratory. Oh my gosh. Yeah. If you think of anything else, you're always welcome to come back and you should totally release your, like, you should release your timeline of um, Will and Nico, like <laughs> yeah, all of that stuff. <clears throat> yeah. People will eat that up. Yes, they will. <laughs> all right. Find out if there was a scene that was cut. Yeah. Cut for time. I feel like maybe there was one. Totally. But it's bugging me because I can't remember anything about it, but I got to go back through the edit. To yeah. See. We'll go read re- read the it unreleased feels, drafts. It feels almost absurd to ask this because clearly everyone listening to this definitely knows who you are. But is right. there anything that you want to promote that's like coming down the no. line? Or I, um... I, am, I don't have a book out for another year. So uh, I wrote a book Fair. while I was on tour. Oh wow. wow! Okay, a machine. I my ex middle grade earlier this year, and there was actually a day. I think it was when we were flying to San Francisco, where I wrote like ten thousand words on the plane. Um, so yeah, I wrote wow. a whole book. It doesn't come out till next year. It's a middle grade. It's spooky. It's funny. It's about grief. Um, oh. I'm working on my next YA, which we don't know when it's come out because I don't even know when I'm going to finish it. Um, and then I have like two more books under contract and I don't know what they're going to be. I think I want to do the gay villain book, yes! but I don't know what that's going to be either. <laughs> I'm pulling up vibes at this point, but you know, I, MarcoShare.com is where you can find me. I'm Mark the Stuff and all the social threads, Blue Sky, Twitter, Instagram, Mark the Stuff. Let them cook. They are cooking. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Um, thank you, Mark. And the next time you see us podcast listeners, it's Chalice of the Gods time. I do believe so. We'll get there. All right. Bye, everybody. Bye, everyone. Bye, all.